Well, on Sunday evenings, we've been thinking together about the glory of God. In case you think that I'm smarter than I am, which I'm not, I've been taking uh, a lot of um, what we've been looking at, a lot of the content from this great outline by two theologians from the States on the glory of God. And uh, I've been preaching through this outline uh, from this book. And uh, they say God's glory is thus the following. Glory possessed, God's unique glory. So we've thought about that. Glory displayed. So how God partially reveals his glory in creation, in his image bearers, in his providence and salvation. So we've thought about that together over the last few weeks. There's some more aspects of God's glory that we're going to look over the next two or three Sunday evenings. And we've thought about how God is glorious in himself and makes his glory known supremely in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who's the radiance of God's glory. But what I want to think about this evening is the fact that in scripture we're to give God glory and he receives glory from us. So we thought about the glory of God in himself and as he displays it but there's more senses in which the Bible talks about glory and I want to think tonight about glory ascribed and glory received. Now some people are just really hard to buy presents for. Uh, My dad is one of those people. You just can't think of anything that they don't already have and you're almost like what's the point? What is the point of buying them something? I can't I can't think of of giving them something they don't already have. Now, there are many, many places in the Bible where glory is something that we do. We are to glorify God. We are to give God glory in the form of, of worship, of exaltation, lifting the Lord up, exaltation, delighting in him and obedience. Some scriptures spring to mind. So the the psalm that we've just read, and there's many, many psalms like this, ascribe glory, give to God the glory due his name. Scribe to the Lord glory, Psalm 29 verse 2. So glory is something we are to do. Or just think of the the Christmas story, the birth of Jesus. The shepherds uh, hear the heavenly host glorifying God and they go and see uh, Jesus in the manger uh, and we read Luke chapter 2 verse 40 I think that they returned glorifying God. If you read through Paul's letters very often they have this thing uh, either at the beginning or the end of doxology a praise of God and they say to him be glory to uh, uh, To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 3, verse 21. To the king immortal, eternal, invisible, that's in in the book of 1 Timothy. To him be glory. So the readers of the letter and ourselves are are to give glory to God. There's other ways in the New Testament we give glory to God. Matthew 5, verse 13, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uh, says, live such good lives that as we shine as we are like a light shining out, others might see our good deeds and give glory to God. So by our deeds, we give glory to God. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 20, uh, Paul says to the church, you were bought with a cr- price, so glorify God in your body. So our bodies, our actual physical bodies are, are to glorify God. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31, Paul says, Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, whether you decide to eat meat, whether you don't decide to eat meat, however that affects somebody, whatever you do practically, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, give glory to God. The practical decisions of our lives uh, are to give glory to God, our eating and our drinking. Book of 1 Peter, how we use our spiritual gifts in the church, whether we serve or whether we speak or whatever we do, we're to do it in such a way that it brings glory to God. Romans 15 verse 16, there's to be a a, a great unity among Christians in the gospel 
so that it brings glory to God. So giving glory is something that we are to do. We're commanded to bring glory to God, whether in worship or praise or obedience, a whole of our lives, we're to bring glory to God. Yeah, here's the thing. If what we've been looking at the other Sunday evenings is true, you might think, well, what is the point? Because if God is self-sufficient and he lacks nothing and he is absolutely blessed in who he is, he is full of glory and displays his glory, he doesn't need our faith and worship. He doesn't need our praise. Acts 17 Verse 25, Paul, preaching to the Areopagus, says uh, the gods um, who made the living gods, who made heaven and earth. He doesn't live in a temple. He's not served by human hands as if he needs anything. He himself gives life and breath to um, to everything. So we're not to think that our obedience or our glorifying God adds anything to him. We can't give, make God more glorious than he already is. He's eternally glorious as Father, Son and Holy Spirit. My glory I will not give to another. So absolutely incredible. So how is it that we are to glorify God? C.S. Lewis famously in his little reflections on the Psalms, said he used to find that really annoying about the Psalms because uh, the the continual kind of praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And you think, well, you wouldn't like that kind of person who just wants to talk about themselves all the time, would you? Uh, We we don't like about those people who, who just go on about themselves. Is God like that? Well, he's not at all because The command to glorify him is ultimately for our goods. God is self-exalting because he is the best and most glorious. And he's also self-giving. Here's the great truth of scripture. But though God is completely sufficient, he is pleased to receive our praise and worship. We genuinely glorify him and he's pleased to accept that because it gives more grace to us and more enjoyment of himself to us and and displays his fullness and sufficiency. So as we come by faith and worship and praise and delight in God, it exalts him and it shows his glory and goodness. So though he is completely sufficient in himself, he is pleased to accept our worship. Worship is a gift which is absolutely amazing that we should delight in the living gods. So I was trying to put it like this. Um, Here's this teaspoon and it's next to the Pacific Ocean. And uh, the Pacific Ocean says to the teaspoon, hello, Mr. Teaspoon. Mr. Teaspoon says, hello, Pacific Ocean. Pacific Ocean says to this teaspoon, do you think I'm sufficient to fill you? The teaspoon says, Of course you're sufficient to fill me. You are absolutely vast. And the teaspoon says, "Hmm, what is the best way that I could show my teaspoon friends and everybody around me that the Pacific Ocean is so incredibly vast and so totally full of water? And uh, the teaspoon says, what I'll do is I'll measure out the the Pacific Ocean bit by bit. Plup, plup, plup. And he never gets the end of it. Just that little teaspoon, as small as wincy, 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 wincy little teaspoon, a vast, vast, vast Pacific Ocean. And yet, as the uh, Pacific, uh, as the teaspoon goes on, you're getting some idea of the sheer immensity of the object that it's showing the greatness of now that is ridiculous but the difference between us and the living gods 
is far greater than the difference between the teaspoon and the Pacific Ocean. God differs absolutely eternally from us in every way. He is infinite, full of infinite goodness and infinite grace. So when we come to praise him, we're actually relying on his resources and his goodness. We're not adding anything to him. In fact, we're receiving from him and we're showing his sufficiency and grace and goodness. And it exalts him, shows him to be great in our lives as we do so. I love this verse from Isaiah chapter 12. Isaiah chapter 12. This is what praise and worship is. Isaiah chapter 12. The Lord says, you will say in that day, I will give thanks to the Lord. For though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. That's salvation through the cross. Anger deferred, comfort gained through Christ. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And in that day you will say, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Do you see there's a connection? As we with joy draw water and grace from God and receive his glory and goodness in the gospel that turns into praise of God and so glorifies him so every day what am I to do I'm to I've got my little rusty buckets I go in my study to read the bible and to pray or wherever it is I've got my little rusty bucket and I'm winching it down into the ocean of Christ's grace and I'm getting something and I'm receiving grace with joy, drawing water from the well of salvation, so that I return praise to him. John Piper, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. That's what praise is. C.S. Lewis, praise seems to be inner health made audible. It's a wonderful phrase. When we are healthy as Christians, we are most praising We are most thankful. We are most talking about God. When we are unhealthy, we are least praising. And uh, to be healthy is to be praising. So it's absolute wonder. Although God does not need our worship, he is pleased to accept it in Christ as praise to him. And we are to glorify God. That means to recognise his glory to ascribe him glory and greatness, to praise him and prize him, to make him known in our lives, to bring him glory by every part of us. Which means if we're to be healthy Christians who love the glory of God, we're to be serious about worship and praise, just the the glorious duty of praise So that means private worship, that in our lives we have a private relationship with God. There are times where we go maybe into our rooms, private in the house. And that private time is not just uploading with information about the Bible, but praising God, telling God in his presence how great he is, worshipping him. Uh, That can be hard to do. There are many distractions and time to praise and worship that can be worship together with husband and wife family worship it's a great thing in the bible families together to praise and worship to hear the bible to sing songs to that god is known and loved in our homes all of life is to be worshipped to god you can glorify god by doing your duty you can glorify god by being a steam train driver or uh, doing the security at a a nuclear power station, or a a geography teacher, or a language teacher. Uh, You can glorify God in in all kinds of ways. Um, J.S. Bach, most famous Welsh composer, J.S. Bach. Um, (laughs) Sorry, I I get that. Um, But he used to write at the the end of his symphonies, uh, on the manuscript where he wrote the, the symphonies, SDG, Soli Deo Gloria. 
to the glory of God alone. We don't have to <coughs> compose a symphony. We can bring glory to God. But most especially in the Bible, corporate worship. <coughs> Coming together as God's people. There is something important, the Bible says, about corporate worship in the presence of God together. So what we're doing this evening, what we do Sunday by Sunday, the, the shared worship of God's people is really, really important in Scripture. We are actually ascribing God glory and strength and greatness to receive God's grace is to exhale glory to breathe praise back to him let's be people who are serious about bringing glory to God's